the simplicity of the gospel. Welcome to church. This morning, we're going to have a kind of different kind of presentation. I've invited some persons to help me preach the message today. And I'm sure that you're going to get something from whatever we present today. The whole idea behind this is that most people who are spiritual and most people who are watching can actually see that there is a void in the life of our children. Our children are hearing the wrong things. They're not reading the Bible. They don't know what the Bible says. And I think it's the responsibility of the church to make a great effort. Thank you. To make a great effort to get some Bible into our children before it's too late. So we do this in Sunday school, but I just thought we'll do it this morning because the things that we want to talk to these children about, the children are not here on Sunday night. They're not here on Thursday night. So once a month, we're going to just pull aside and we are going to address the children. Is that okay with you? Somebody said children are age one to 101. So if you're any, anywhere between that, you're going to be able to benefit. What, what we are talking about then, and if you're following television and whatever, you will you'll, you'll hear the word a biblical worldview or a Christian worldview. By that I mean, if you put on uh, spectacles, glasses that are pink, you're going to see everything pink. If you put on blue, you're going to see everything blue. Put the Bible in, in place of your spectacles. And everything that you say, everything that you do, every place you go or whatever, we want you to see the Bible. Your question should be, what does the Bible say about this? What does God say about this? This is not where our children are going. They are hearing everything but LGBT. Um, they are being affected with homosexuality. Teachings are coming from the radio, the television, from their friends. But the church is the one that has to give the, the, the Christian perspective. So a biblical worldview then is based on God's unchanging word. Sometimes we use biblical worldview and Christian worldview, we use them um, as alternatives, but they're, they're basically not the same. So what we're talking to you about this morning is a biblical worldview. Let me give you an example. People think that whatever happens in a Christian church is a Christian worldview. And now let me re rephrase that. People think that whatever happens in a Christian church is a biblical worldview. That's not true. Because some denominations are knowingly appointing homosexual men married to other men as bishops in the church. That's a Christian worldview because it happens in a Christian church, but that is certainly not a biblical worldview. So what we're asking us all to do is look at things from a biblical perspective. There's some other perspectives that you'll hear when you go to places of higher education. You will hear about a secular worldview. That is a worldview that teaches the beliefs in matter uh, and that there's no absolute truth nothing everything varies nothing is true that is called a secular worldview and then they have the scientific worldview where people believe only on things that they can prove scientifically if it doesn't happen in a petri dish or or something like that they don't believe it so you have the secular worldview you have the scientific worldview and then they have another worldview called the post-modern worldview and they believe that there's no absolute truth they will tell you well, there's no truth it all depends but we want to get our children into the biblical worldview we want them to know what the bible says about killing we want them to know what the bible says about sexuality we want them to know what the bible says about obedience about forgiveness if you listen to children talk to you today you wonder if they have never, ever seen a Bible before. So we're going to do our job to try to tell our children about this. It's the name of the Lord. This is indeed a good day, nice, bright, and shiny, to give all the honor and glory and praise to God for his goodness towards us. Why do we believe the Bible? Why do you believe the Bible? Is it because you've 
heard people say you should believe it. It's because your conscience tells you it is the right thing to do. Do you feel pressured to believe? If you say you don't believe, you might be victimized. It's a whole lot of reasons. We're going to look this morning at the origin of the Bible. The word origin suggests the first idea. Not the first time something started, but the very first idea concerning that thing. So the origin of the Bible did not start with us. It started with the creator of all things, the creator of heaven and earth. It started with the one who was there before all things, the one who spoke all things into being. My objective this morning is to show from scripture that the Bible came from God. My aim is that each child, each person will know and understand and be convinced in their own hearts that the Bible is not just a storybook. It's not just a storybook. In the world, there's a common misunderstanding by a lot of people, the intelligentsias, of course, who are saying, and they're teaching publicly, that the Bible was written by the King of England called King James I. In truth and in fact, he did not, the Bible did not originate with him. He got some men to translate what originated with God into different languages. So we have the King James Version, which we are very comfortable with. The truth is, however, that the Bible was written, as I said, the idea started with God. But it was not written by King James. It was written by holy men. Not any kind of man. Not a riffraff. Not a drunkard. Not a man who didn't know anything about the creator. But it was written by holy men. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21 tells us, knowing this first, the first thing you need to know is that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't just jump up and decide this is what God means. It is not of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in all times by the will of men. Men didn't just jump up and say, but holy men of God spoke as they were directed by the Holy Ghost. They spoke not off the top of their heads, but as they were directed within their spirits by the power of God. So, children in particular, you can think about this. What makes our Bible different from any other storybook? Because we hear the Bible is a storybook. It tells a lot of stories about Joseph and Daniel and the lions and all this. What makes the Bible different? What makes the Bible different from the story of the three little pigs? What makes it different from the story of Little Red Riding Hood? What makes it different from the story of Rumpeltiltskin? Their stories and their good stories, we've enjoyed them when we were children. They're good stories. Or you can ask yourselves, we can ask ourselves, what makes our Bible different even from the history books that are being used in school? The books that we were taught from in school. What makes our Bible so different? Second Timothy chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17 says, all scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is given for particular reasons. It is given to be profitable. It is given for doctrine. 
something that is taught. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That is in the word of God. That is what it teaches us. It teaches us what you did wrong. Reproof. It is for reproof. It highlights what you did wrong. For example, children, you're not supposed to be playing or running around the church during service. It is not written in the Bible that way. But that is not acceptable. That is not what God would want us to do. So somebody will come and say, hey, you know you're not supposed to be doing that. That is reproof. That is reproof. And that is what the Bible tells us. When we get into sin, God is faithful through his word to say to us, hey, Baba, you know that is not right. You know that is not acceptable. You know that is not what I want you to do. So the word of God reproves us. It corrects us. It tells you the right thing to do. Stop running around in church. Stop playing outside when service is going on. Stop running the tap and wasting water. It corrects you by telling you, turn the tap off when you finish washing your hands. Stop running around. You might fall and hurt yourself. The word of God is also given for instruction in righteousness not just instruction it would have been good if God had said my word is for instruction but it's for instruction in righteousness because every instruction is not necessarily instruction in righteousness your friend can tell you go pick Miss John's mangoes that is an instruction but that's not an instruction in righteousness that is not the right thing to do. As a matter of fact, it is the very wrong thing to do. Verse 17 says, all of this happens that the man of God may be perfect. Not sinless perfection as in you will never sin. But to be perfect in this sense, the word of God, the man of God, the child of God, the people of God may be perfect as in being the best you can be. You're going to do some little things that are not acceptable. But generally, as you follow the word of God and you're being reproved and corrected and taught, you're going to be made perfect. You're going to be doing the thing that you're supposed to do and you're going to be doing it often you're going to be thoroughly truly furnished not thoroughly furnished although they're interchange truly furnished in other words god in his word not in the blatant god has given us in his word everything we need to be able to do what he says he's not going to ask us to do something that we're not capable physically or mentally or intellectually capable of doing if he says thou shalt not steal kids are we not capable of not stealing is that a yes or no you're capable of not stealing if the word of God says, when the word of God says, thou shall not bear false witness or tell lies upon somebody else. Are we not capable of doing that? We are truly furnished. God has given us the ability, the intellect, the basic common sense and, and that moral thing that stirs inside our spirits to tell us when we are doing right and when we are doing wrong. So we are truly furnished unto every good work. We are able to do exactly, exactly what God says. Now there are three important things I want us to know about the Bible. 
as a poster in a blatant Pinocchio or Cinderella or Frozen or The Three Musketeers or any of those books that you love that you will, so to speak, die for. Three important things to know about the Bible. Firstly, it reveals. Anybody can tell me what reveal means? Kids? When you hear the Bible reveals, what is it doing? It shows something. When something is revealed, <coughs> that suggests that you didn't know it before. You didn't even know that it was there. But you come across it. How do you come across it in the Bible? God reveals his word in his word. God tells us the thing we did not know was right or wrong. God tells us and the Holy Spirit bears witness with us that that is what God says. So it reveals, it shows how God created us to behave as well as the things we should do to please him. So if you didn't know that stealing would not please God, God tells us now in his word, he reveals to us through the Holy Spirit, thou shall not steal. So we know now we are not supposed to steal. It, for the older folk, it illuminates. For the little ones, it brings a clear picture and makes things simple so that we can understand. Thirdly, it gives instructions and rules as to how God expects us to live. Instructions and rules as to how God expects us to live. None of the other books that we read, none of the other books that we use in school do this. So those three important things you need to know is that it shows, it makes things clear and it gives instructions. And to summarize, I will say, there is no other book that comes even close to the Bible. The stories in the Bible are true and everything in the Bible helps us to live, to live a life that makes God happy with us and it teaches us to do the right things. So our Bible is different from all the other books and it has lived on. There are books that are drawn off because nobody's bothering to read them. But men and women are still reading the Bible. Yes, they're arguing about it, but they're reading it. And God is able through his spirit to reveal himself and what he wants us to do so that we can please him. The simplicity of the gospel.